Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're focused on organizations engaged in various forms of diplomacy, whether it's conflict resolution, training and exchange programs, age developing new, new leaders, or working to expand support for faith-based peacemaking. Each of our guests today is dedicated to promoting peace, cooperation, and dialogue among and within nations. And they are Mickey Bergman, Vice President and Executive Director of the Richardson Center for Global Engagement. Mr. Kelsch, Executive Director of the Mississippi Consortium for International Development. And James Patton, President and CEO of the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. So thank you all for, for joining us. It's just great to have you here. And Mickey, I'm gonna to go to you at the Richardson Center, but just to set you up, you know, diplomacy always conjures images of uh, interactions between representatives of sovereign states but it's way more dynamic today. And as a matter of fact, Governor Richardson is one of the architects of this different type of diplomacy. This and uh, President Carter and, and so many others, this idea of, of having non-governmental state, uh, non-state actors engage in places where state actors can't. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the Richardson Center, your work, and the dimensions of diplomacy that the governor has pursued and, and his inspiration uh, for that pursuit. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for, for, for having me uh, on this. Uh, so the Richardson Center, as I said, we, we, we promote the, the big mission. We, we promote global peace and dialogue by identifying work and working in areas of opportunity for engagement with countries and with communities that are typically not open to, to more formal uh, diplomatic channels. Um, uh, one of the things that we're most known for um, is working on the release of political prisoners and hostages uh, from a lot of these countries. That's something that Governor Richardson, uh, as both as congressman, as ambassador to the United Nations, as secretary of energy and governor of New Mexico has done. Uh, but now in the last uh, 12 years, are doing, we're doing this uh, uh, from outside of government. Um, uh, we do this work on behalf of families and at no cost to them, of course. And... Um, and it, it, the way we do it, we deploy something we like to call fringe diplomacy um, on the fringes. Uh, and the idea of it is really going beyond uh, just the space that it goes beyond the mandate of international uh, governments uh, in international relations, um, uh, deploying, uh, even though the governor himself is the, is the head and the inspiration of the organization, we deploy academics, we deploy business, we deploy artists, depends on what the community that we're targeting is interested in. Uh, You're deploying so, people who can connect. Correct. In ways that are not necessarily standard through any kind of transaction. You have nothing to, to bargain with, right? That is correct. So it's not about transactions. It's about building the relationships. And it's not about the, the formalities of diplomacy. It's about actual people, meeting people, sharing experiences around areas of interest and priority for them. Uh, uh, just given an example, uh, three months ago, we were able to release uh, American journalist Danny Fenster from Myanmar. Uh, the way we were able to do it or the way the governor was able to do this uh, was because for more than 12 years, we have worked in Myanmar on issues of humanitarian assistance, on political training, um, uh, on investment delegations. I took uh, seven different investment delegations there responding to the Myanmar people's uh, priorities. We built the relationships that allowed us to be invited in a moment of crisis and do this intervention. So it's two parts, intervention and engagement. And, and, and that long-term um, presence, that long-term engagement is really important, isn't it, Crystal? I mean, this, this whole idea of credibility and building credibility and, and really paying attention to the details is really critical. Crystal, could you talk a little bit about the Mississippi Consortium? And Absolutely. How Absolutely. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to, to join you today. Um, my organization, as Mark has mentioned, is the Mississippi Consortium for International Development. Um, thus, the name connotes we were birthed in the state of Mississippi. Our founder is, the, um, is Dr. Allie Mack, and she was the Dean of International Programs at Jackson State University. So in trying to cull uh, many different grants, she decided that the best way to fulfill uh, some of the obligations of these grants was to uh, pull together some of the intellectual capital at the HBCUs in Mississippi. So thus the consortium was born. She pulled together uh, Jackson State, Alcorn, 
Tougaloo College and Mississippi Valley State as part of our consortium to help facilitate many of our programs. My organization, however, um, well, my segment of the organization is based in Washington, D.C., and we are geared towards working on just the International Visitor Leadership Program for the U.S. Department of State. As um, Mickey has mentioned, he talked about building relationships. And that's what the International Visitor Leadership Program tries to do. We try to build a relationship with people all over the world. It is a professional exchange program that allows individuals from different industries to come to the United States to meet their professional counterparts. But the most important part of, that, of this program is the relationships that we build. It's not just about learning about the media or learning about grassroots organizing. It's also about meeting Americans and learning more about Americans, learning the things that you don't find in the media, um, getting that information that's much more personal, um, allowing people to dispel stereotypes and to understand us as, as individuals, not as a country that's governed by its political stigmas or any other types of um, negative things that they may find in the media. You know, I, I, I love this, this idea. We're going to get to James as well, because this, this, this idea of coming from the HBCU tradition, right? The, the idea of historically Black colleges um, and the credibility that they have developed through their own history and struggles and the communities served and the constituencies that surround them, it's it's so unique and it's a uniquely American attribute that can now be put out into the world in ways that has resonance, that can be connectors, right? We're using our own attributes. And it's the same thing with you, James, right? I mean, we're using this sort of faith-based ideal and, and each of you, they, you, you, each, you each occupy these unique positions that allow you to be tremendously effective in certain situations and perhaps less effective than your partners and others. James, could you talk a little bit about how you come at this idea of conflict resolution and diplomacy? Well, I think you put it very well when you when you raised partnership. And uh, first of all, I'm very grateful and honored to be here with Crystal and, and Mickey and, and the rest of you, including our attendees. So thank you for, for exploring this topic. But we, uh, the way that we approach this work, we're not a confessional organization. We're not a religious organization. We're a conflict resolution, violence prevention organization that recognizes the importance of religion and religious faith uh, in, in human community. And in particular, how uh, those communities decide to interact across identity differences. Uh, now, I think when the founder, Dr. Douglas Johnston, established the organization, there was a climate in Washington where we're located that the government was somewhat pathologically resistant to engaging religion and religious uh, considerations because of a sort of a real politique power based concept of how states interact with one another. Uh, he made the argument at the time that that was not a sufficient kind of engagement. We needed to take religion seriously. And I think post 9-11, uh, suddenly people did take religion seriously, but they took it oftentimes uh, seriously only in what we would call, I guess, a, a deficit-based approach, which is to say, how is it part of the problem? Um, and that, that really informed a securitized approach to religion, religious actors uh, that we have worked hard to sort of unwind. So we look at how does religion religious identity institutions, how does that form a resilience in the community that can partner with and be incorporated into other efforts at diplomacy and conflict resolution? So that's how we approach our work. And it, and it manifests differently in every context because uh, the drivers of, of violence or the conditions that might lead to violence are different in every context. And the role and influence of, of religion, religious actors is different. So partnership, uh, to, to take the word that you mentioned, uh, is critical to what we do because, um, you know, one of the, I think one of the problems in this work is we, we end up siloing our different areas of interest uh, to the detriment of the work. Uh, so we try to integrate the, the role of religion, religious actors into other kinds of peacebuilding work and diplomacy. I'm really interested in, in uh, your take 
um, on the communications landscape because diplomacy is really about people interacting. And now we're interacting in these in these uh, environments, but even in this environment, we have in the we have a Zoom environment which we can see. Uh, we have a much broader environment in terms of Twitter Live, YouTube Live, Facebook Live, which we can't see in real time, right? People are signing in, signing off. And there's asynchronous communication. We're seeing how groups can be formed to advance civil society and attack it. We see uh, the use of disinformation. Um, let's just go around the table and talk about sort of this communication landscape and how it facilitates but also can be used by people who want to gin up conflict, facilitates conflict resolution, but also be used by people who gin up conflict. James, uh, since we were with you, uh, why don't you start off and then we'll go to Mickey and, and Crystal. Um, do you see the use of these tools as being helpful, um, hindering, or perhaps if it's a mix of both, how do you use these tools in order to facilitate your work? Well, you know, and I would say it's very much a mix of both. Like, like many things, the the tool itself is value neutral and it just it's really gains value in terms of how it's employed. So when COVID hit uh, as an international organization that brings people together to talk, uh, we had a moment of panic that uh, the, the kind of lockdown and the inability to travel and, and to convene was going to have significant impact on our work. Uh, but we were able to shift a lot. And I'll give you one example. I literally just got off of an ongoing call where we are engaged with Saudi teachers on working uh, concepts of religious literacy and tolerance, um, preventing extremism, human rights, et cetera, into the curriculum in the kingdom. Uh, that wouldn't have happened the same way without the Zoom platform. I was able to, to bring together trainers from a whole host of different areas that had the expertise on these themes, and we brought in trainees or participants from across the kingdom. Now, if we had tried to do that in person, which was the original plan, the costs might have been prohibitive. Yeah, if you start off your di diplomatic effort, with the first thing you have to do is charter a jet for your, your folks, right? Exactly. It, it, it's tough. And I see, Mickey, you're, you're nodding. And, and uh, you know, your people are famous for flying all over the place. Has this, has this uh, been able to help you in the way James, it's helped James's organization? It, it, it has, as James said, it, it's, it's neutral, uh, uh, but it has done some damage and gave us some opportunities. Um, they, for us, it's interesting because the people that we typically try to negotiate with will be the Iranians, the Venezuelans, the, the, the North Koreans, they don't jump on Zoom. Um, uh, so we didn't really have that opportunity uh, uh, to do this with them. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the, the, that sense of, of uh, humanitarian crisis around, uh, around the pandemic offered us an opportunity um, to find ways to, to work and co cooperate with people and countries and communities that typically would not cooperate with you. So we tried to deploy that. We were able to actually get a couple of people out of uh, political imprisonment because of the pandemic. But I have to admit, it is much, much tougher. So much of what we do is not about national interests. It's about interactions with individuals. It's finding emotional leverage and connection. Um, and that is possible uh, to do remotely, but much, much harder the nuances of, of conversations, of reactions. When you try to do it, we had negotiations with the Venezuelans over WhatsApp with emojis. I mean, that's the level that it gets to because you're looking for anything that goes beyond the written word. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's so interesting because <clears throat> if you take a look at, at how diplomacy can unfold with different tool sets, now you have different ways in which and different constituents that you can bring together. Uh, people at a much lower income level now have access, although it's not perfect uh, because technology itself becomes a bit of a stumbling block, but you, but you have people with a lot more um, access now. And so you can have really casual person-to-person -person interactions at a, at, a, at a tiny cost and certainly um, highly leveraged. Uh, Crystal, have you been able to leverage your te uh, technology over the last period of time in ways that have been beneficial to your efforts? Absolutely. Um, just from the nature of our program, <laughs> anyway, it, it's an 
in-person program where people from all over the world come to the United States. So in March 2020, that all ceased. And we were sitting for, for 80 years, we did it the same way. And we were sitting here trying to figure out how we could um, engage our participants um, in the same manner. And Zoom became Zoom WebEx and other platforms became our saving grace because we could now engage with our visitors, even though they couldn't come here and meet us personally, we still were able to facilitate our programs. And this was hard for us because we had been doing this for so long um, in the same manner, but it did allow us to see that we could do things differently. You know, and I think in the future it will allow us to do that as well. We just finished a poll in which uh, we asked whether social media and the ability to organize and spread information, disinformation um, electronically has changed the nature and tool set used for diplomacy. Uh, 87% said yes, and 13% said no. Mickey, do you feel like like it's 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 both, right? It has changed it, but it, but there are things that just will never change. It has to be person to person. I, 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 yes, but but I, I would argue that the power of of the of the remote uh, engagement um, is whether it starts or ends with a physical um, uh, uh, exchange, uh, and so you, you need to have that. It's, it's almost like a long term relationship between a couple. It can't exist just if it's remote. You need to have an end game of of getting together, or at least the beginning of getting together before we go remote. Um, and that's a very important key. But I would say more than that, uh, with, with, this, with this remote engagement, we, we have a, a world in which um, uh, we're able to, to pull in, we, people are able to pull in based on, on cognitive biases of individuals, based on their browsing history, time they're spending on stuff, and trigger them emotionally. And again, it's, it, it is a neutral tool in what it is. It, it, it can be positive when it comes to personalized ads, it can be very negative when you're mobilizing a community in a negative way, but it's something that we need to become really aware of uh, when, you, when you get sent an article, when, it, when you feel a, sense, a physical sensation when reading an article that somebody shared on Facebook, one of your friends, stop and, and question, who's sending it to you and for what reason? So is remote manipulation healed by in-person interaction, James? I mean, is that partly what you're, what you're doing? Because when you're... When you're talking about uh, religious differences, because it's about faith, there are some beliefs that place people of different religions in different camps, but they, the common value of religion is to bind humanity together, right? So you've got this, this idea where you have difference, but difference still serves a common purpose. Um, how do you uh, bridge when we're having so much emotion ginned up through the internet, as Mickey said. How do you heal that through through these very traditionalist roots? Religions go back to the the dawn of human history. Uh, it's not new. It's not it's not techy. How do you deal with this? Well, the, there's a lot in that question. I mean, um, and I appreciate the the articulation of that, I want to be sure that, that it's clear when we do our conflict mitigation work, it's not just about where religions are clashing. You know, we're also looking where there are other clashes and identity conflicts where religion and shared values across faith traditions can play a healing role where other things are causing division. Um, but on this question of in-person versus uh, remote or, or even the question of ritual and the question of religious expression, there is undeniably something that happens in person that can't happen on the screen. I mean, when you're talking about conflict prevention or conflict recovery, that includes reconciliation, elements of, of rebuilding social cohesion, there's critical to that is the building of empathy and, and interhuman connectedness where you see yourself in the other. That is much easier when you're breaking bread, when you're sharing ritual, when you're expressing stories, when you're feeling the emotion of the person on the other side as they recount their experience of history. And that, that, those are elements that are very hard uh, to have come across in a virtual space. Uh, again, it's not impossible. And what I think the virtual space allows us to do is lay the groundwork um, with more technical things or more uh, instructional things. For, for instance, if you're going to bring two groups together that are 
inactive conflict or have been in conflict, you need to heal that relationship. Naturally, you're going to work with each group independently first. And you can work virtually with those groups to establish sort of frameworks and knowledge transfer and, and certain things that will allow you to prepare the ground for an eventual interaction that might be more emotionally or spiritually uh, kind of fraught. So th there are ways you can use the tool, but ultimately it, it's impossible in my mind to fully replace the what the intangibles that you get from being face to face with someone. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about a poll that we're, we're currently undertaking and, and get your take on it. We said, what is the most important global challenges we're facing today? And we include a number of different items, access to food, water, hygiene, and health, addressing poverty, fostering prosperity, assuring education for all, avoiding conflict, fostering peace, climate and pollution and justice, freedom, civil rights, and, civil, and a healthy civil society. Here, here are a couple of interesting points. Assuring education for all didn't get many votes. Right? The most votes were, um, were achieved by access to food, water, hygiene, and health, and then climate and pollution. It's not avoiding conflict or wars or any of that. Right? These, are, these are topics that typically would not in a previous time have been identified as being uh, thorny problems for diplomacy, Crystal. And so how do you look at, at the fact that uh, here, and this is of course a select group and, and who knows whether you know, broader civil society globally would, would believe this, but if we have here in this group, um, the vote being access to food, water, hygiene, and health, and climate and pollution being those areas where diplomacy is, is most needed, Crystal, how do you respond to that idea and, and the desire for that type of change that we're seeing emerging from just a, a open-ended question? I think people respond based on what they can connect with. You know, we, we see in this country, you know, food and food security is, is an issue. Um, in many areas of this country that it, it isn't highlighted as much. And it exists um, the same in other countries as well. Um, access to education for women, that is big in, in some countries that many may not even be aware of because these are the things that are not highlighted in the media. We see the general, the basic things, um, but climate, climate, we see here in our region and in the DC metropolitan area, we had 70 degrees on one Christmas when that was never the case. These are things that people can relate to because they feel it, they see it. They may not be as cognizant of what's going on in every country around the world, as many of us aren't, but they are important issues that have to be addressed. But all of those items that you listed in that poll are very important for us to, to pay attention to because the world is changing um, and we have to adapt to those changes and make make a difference by helping people in areas that are that are most needed. Is it possible, Mickey, that what we focus on, as noble as it might be, and what is covered in the, uh, on the as front page news in the press, is less important, is less critical to the masses of humanity um, here than other matters? I, I, that's a that's a good question. I, I wonder, though, uh, based on the conversation both with Crystal and, and James here, uh, to me, uh, it seems that one of the biggest problems that we face now as a society in the United States and as humanity at large on the global uh, on the global scale, and it, we have a breakdown in what used to be the social contract, um, a, a, and and that goes into the sense, and maybe it's the technology that that we're trying to realize how to deal with right now. Uh, that people believe that if they don't get caught, they will cheat. Um, uh, uh, and, and our society is, is based on the fact that people will not cheat even if they, if they know that they will not get caught. And we kind of are losing this. We're almost infected with anger. We're lacking, to James' word, word empathy. Um, uh, and, and knowing that our well-being, even if, look, I'm, 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 I'm a white, uh, uh, a straight man. I'm privileged. Uh, my well-being, I know, relates directly to the well-being of my neighbors who are not 
uh, privileged uh, as I am. And we need to cut back into it. And sometimes people are fearful of that because they confuse empathy with sympathy um, and, and the differentiation between the two. And in empathy, if we look at education, we, we need to get back into it, to empathy. We need to get it back into understanding in the global level and in the country level that our success together is, is so important. So if I have more, I need to compromise in order to make sure that everything that everybody else who don't have can, can lift, can be lifted. And I think, again, it's, 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 it's the key. So going back to the poll, to the question on the poll, people, uh, as Kritzel said very well, they, they, they answer based on what they relate to and what they can actually grab and, and feel. It, we, it seems like here are in the business of human beings um, and, and trying to understand what we're going through as a society here and try to find ways to, to, to deal with that, to mitigate that is so important. So in, in many respects, what you're saying and what, what you all have in common is you are finding paths toward empathetic connections amongst peoples, right? And you're, you're trying to educate, re-educate us in the art of empathy, in the art of building the social compact that is mutually beneficial uh, for us all. You might have different routes to getting there, uh, but uh, James, is that is that a good sum, summation of what you're about, what your organization is about, and what you see on the landscape of diplomacy? Uh, well, I would say two points. One quick one is, you know, it's not, it's not an either or in terms of that list. Uh, and you asked a good question: Are we focused on the right thing? Is is something more important? Uh, should it be pulling our attention? Well. Everything has to be done. We all have to lift part of this heavy stone together and doesn't make uh, the work we're trying to do less important. But you're absolutely right. There are things that underlie all of these issues. Um, but I also want to just want to interject a, a term here. And we just lost one of my personal heroes last month uh, in Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the uh, Vietnamese peace builder. Absolutely brilliant peace builder. And he uses a term interbeing. Right. And the interbeing concept is that it's not that we care for one another because we're compassionate or religion tells us to or we're empathetic. We we are in this boat together, you know, in, in ways that are just you cannot disassociate. I mean, look at the pandemic. Look at the climate crisis. Our fates are tied to one another, regardless of our identity and our geography, our demography. And the sooner we get that into our heads, I think the better. And so it comes back to this point that was just raised, but absolutely. I mean, empathy until we, until we really feel what the others are feeling uh, and, and realize that we are sharing uh, a destiny together. And uh, then we will just go through these cycles of, of, of problems and conflicts. We also rebuilding this idea of what it means to have um, to agree to a certain um, way of doing things that law will rule rather than power, right? In any circumstance, even in a family circumstance, right? We're we're talking about how do you overcome difference passionately held in anything, right? How do you how do you develop a solution when you have a system that exists that has created the problem? How do you change the system when there are interests at stake? So, so we're, we're also talking about uh, providing an education and methods, aren't we? In addition to this idea of empathy, there's also a structure toward co conflict resolution that can be taught to others who might be in conflict or, or might require a, a way to jointly develop solutions. Mickey, do you provide education in that type of a tool set as you pursue your work? I, I, I do. Well, first of all, I, I teach uh, adjunct at, at Georgetown University, and, and my course uh, is Emotional Intelligence and International Relations. Um, and, and when you look at emotional intelligence and you break it into four different planes, the first one is self-awareness. The second one is, is self-management. The third one is awareness of others' emotions. And the fourth one is the ability to influence uh, uh, the relationships based on, the, on that awareness. And if you think about it, it, it starts 
with with our with the ability of of, of ourselves to to realize who we are the self awareness of it get the data points understand who you are in personality i i often tell my students there, there there is a myth in the world that negotiators need to have a certain type of personality why because the most famous negotiators write books they're great books and they teach you how to be negotiator if you are them but we're not them we're well, different they're famous because they're very good at promoting their their fame i mean it's almost definitional it, right crystal it, <laughs> yeah i mean we have so many instances where people meet one another not knowing who they are, what they're about, and they end up at the end of the day, you know, the best of friends. I had one instance where a group from all over the country I and mean, all over the world, 20 different countries, and one woman said, she was from Albania, she said, you know, I have never met anyone from the Gambia, and the gentleman from the Gambia has become my best friend. I had stereotypes. That's what she said. I had stereotypes. And I lost those stereotypes because she was able to just interact with someone different. So when we experience something different, when we um, hear different information, we're able to grasp that and understand it and say, oh, this isn't so bad after all. So there's, there's hope for our world. As long as we can continue to have dialogue, I think we will continue to understand one another and be a more peaceful society. What a, what a, what a great exit note, uh, since we're coming to the end of our time, the idea of glorying indifference. Um, we, we just finished a poll, which basically uh, deals with this. Um, and just to read off the top three picks for uh, what are the three most important goals of non-traditional diplomatic efforts, mitigating extremes, empowering and engaging citizens, and enhancing mutual understanding. Mickey Bergman, Vice President and Executive Director of the Richardson Center for Global Engagement. Crystal Kelsch, Executive Director of the Mississippi Consortium for International Development. James Patton, President and CEO of the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank your staffs, thank your volunteers, thank your funders, and thank your boards. It's just been great, great learning from you. So- It's been an honor, thank you. Thank Everybody you. have a great, great day, and we'll see you on Thursday. All right. Yeah, Take stay care. Safe.